I like the way that she said that. She said the naked truth instead of the naked truth. The difference between naked and naked, for those of you wondering, if you are naked, you don't have any clothes on. If you are naked, you don't have any clothes on and you are up to no good. So that is the, that's the difference there of that good southern word, naked. Hey, um, I'm excited about today because we got a free gift for everybody that is in the house this morning. And my motto in life is, if it's free, it's for me. And so on your way out, everybody is going to get their very own peppermint-flavored Christ Walk chapstick because it's Valentine's Day and nobody wants to be smooching up on your chapped nasty lips. So freshen it up, get yourself right, get your chapstick on the way out, man. It is going to be an awesome day. If you got your Bible or a smart device, why don't you turn with me or swipe with me to the New Testament. We're going to take a look at one of the Apostle Paul's letters, um, Ephesians, and we're going to land in chapter 5 of Ephesians here in just a moment. Um, So you can go ahead and turn there uh, and get there to be ready. Um, In 2001, a couple by the name of Bill and Pam Farrell, who are marriage and relationship experts, they wrote a book entitled, Men Are Like Waffles and Women Are Like Spaghetti. And the subtitle is, Understanding and Delighting in Your Differences. And now, when we hear that book title, you need to know that this isn't just like some cutesy little uh, uh, analogy or, or some super creative title or whatever, there's actually scientific evidence based on various neurological studies that this is actually the truth of how men and women both process uh, information and how they think. So when it comes to um, the, their, their processing at a cognitive level, men are truly like waffles and women are like Spaghetti. And these studies show that uh, when men engage in various tasks or process information, that they only use certain parts of their brain to do so. And that largely the left half of their brain is not uh, readily interconnected with the right, ha- right half of their brain um, as they're engaging in these tasks. And it's, it's really quite a bit more compartmentalized. But when women engage in tasks or process information, there are literally synapses firing all over their brains all the time in a more randomized manner across the entirety of their brain. And the studies also indicate that in the female brain, both the right half and the left half of the brain are more uh, readily interconnected during these processes, um, which differs quite a bit from the men. And so just to help everybody out, I've got um, some pictures uh, here this morning. Men, waffles, women, uh, spaghetti. Just want to be sure that we're all clear. So the male brain, it is... It's fully compartmentalized just like this waffle. Um, and the, the, women's, the, the woman's brain, it is, it is fully, completely intertwined. There's, it's really difficult to tell where one noodle starts and the other, and, and one ends and another begins and everything, and it's all just wrapped up in there together. And so the way that this plays out in everyday life is, men, we have all these boxes that we put things in. So men, when, when men are at work, they're at work. And when men are on the boat fishing, they're on the boat fishing. And when men are, are sitting on the couch scrolling aimlessly through Instagram on their cell phone, they are sitting on the couch scrolling aimlessly through Instagram on their cell phone. And one of these boxes for every man is actually a box that is completely and totally empty that we can go, as a man, we can go to this place that women think is a fictitious place, but we can go to this place where we are literally doing and thinking absolutely nothing. It exists. And all the ladies are like, yeah, I'm familiar with that place. I've seen my husband go there quite a bit. Women, on the other hand, 
can have two loads of laundry going, be cooking a complete meal for dinner, feeding a bottle to a baby that is on their hip while they're talking on speakerphone to their mother as they scroll through Pinterest, looking for new recipe ideas, making a grocery list, all the while overseeing the kids doing their homework all simultaneously. And the man is over in the lazy boy reading the newspaper. Just reading the newspaper. That's it. And already you can begin to feel the tension that is at play here in these types of relationships. And part of the issue is, is that we don't just develop these waffle and spaghetti tendencies at the moment we enter into a marriage relationship. We were born this way. And so the problem really arises because for 20 to 30 years, we've lived our lives this way. And then we have the bright idea that maybe it would be great for us to bring these two things together and have them interact with each other and rub up against each other ongoing daily for the rest of our lives. Like whoever said that God didn't have a sense of humor, right? And so we bring these different approaches to life and, and we put them together, the different approaches of how we process information, our ability or lack thereof to be able to multitask, the way that we communicate with one another, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as a married man of, it'll be 16 years, I think this, uh, 17 years this year in September, um, can I just say that the Beatles were dead wrong when they said that all you need is love? <laughs> like, a after 17 years, I think that I've gotten it figured out that you actually need a little bit more than that. It's not that easy. It doesn't just work that way. I mean, honestly, how many of you have ever thought when you're thinking of what's for dinner, you thought, you know, I really wish that we were having waffles and spaghetti tonight, right? Nobody thinks that because those two things that sounds disgusting. They don't go together. And so that's what we've been thrust in when it comes to marriage. Yet despite all of this craziness, despite all of the chaos and the seeming incongruity in the midst of all of this, this right here is God's design for our lives. Let me show you what I mean. All the way back in, at the beginning of the Bible, when, when God created the, he instituted the covenant of marriage in Genesis chapter two, the author writes this, beginning with verse 18, it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground, all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. Continuing on in verse 21, it says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last! The man exclaimed, this one is bone for my bone and flesh for my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. And then verse 24, it says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. So before we jump into our Ephesians passage, let me give you just a couple notes from this passage, a couple, a couple points that we can pull out as we're laying the foundation for not just today's message, but this entire series that we're jumping into today. First off, it is not good for us to be alone. You and I were created to be in community with other people and with God. That's why we talk about life groups here all the time and why it's so important for you to be a part of a life group. You need to be doing life. You need to be in a circle, get out of these rows, get into a circle, get around someone's dinner table, get in their living room. You need to be in a relationship like that with other people people. 
And out of the fact that we have been created to be in community with other people, we discover that marriage is a good thing. It's also a God thing. That's what this passage tells us. Marriage is a good thing. God said it is not good for man to be alone. So then it is good and it is God for us to come together and be in relationship with one another. This passage also, as it introduces the covenant of a marriage, um, underscores two main components of the marriage relationship. And, and the first one of those is servanthood. Verse 18 says, I will make, this is God talking, I will make a helper who is just right for him, for the man. This, this is servanthood. This is talking about the meeting of needs, that one of the reasons we are in a marriage relationship is so that husbands, you can meet the needs of your wife, wives, you can meet the needs of your husband, and everybody working together has their needs met. Servanthood is foundational to the marriage relationship. And then the second thing that is foundational to the marriage relationship, the second main component is that of Sex. In verse 24, um, the author writes, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Or some translations say one flesh. This is, this is sex. So where servanthood is the meaning of need, sex is physical intimacy. The two are united into one. No, I don't have a diagram for that, so don't get uncomfortable but we can use our imaginations. We see how that works, all right? So there are two main components of marriage are servanthood and sex. You can't have a healthy relationship of any kind without servanthood. And you can't have a healthy marriage without sex. And both of these things must work together hand in hand. And when they don't, things can get off the rails pretty quickly. Can I get a good amen from the married people in the room? And so for those of you that may be wondering, um, just to clarify, uh, let me help out the ladies for a little bit. You're wondering what compartment on the waffle is sex for the man? And see, that's where you've gotten it wrong. The waffle is sex for the man, okay? It's not a compartment, it's the whole thing. And then, guys, you're wondering, like, does it exist down there? Yes, down there somewhere deeply intertwined into the very core of that tangle of noodles. I promise you, it's in there somewhere, but you might just have to put a little bit of effort and a little bit of, be, be a little bit delicate in, in getting, but it's in there, and I promise that it can be found. So today on Valentine's Day, I can't think of a better series to kick off than one called The Naked or The Naked Truth, where over the next few weeks, we're gonna take a look at marriage and sex and just relationships in general through the lens of God's word. And I believe that despite the fact that the Bible was written thousands of years ago, it is still has time, full of timeless truths that are applicable to our modern lives today. And if you and I will simply take the time to mine out these truths and begin to apply them to our lives, then it is is 100% possible for us to have the very best marriages full of the very best sex and overall in our lives, the very best relationships that we can possibly have because living our lives in accordance with God's word and the principles that are found therein, it is absolutely the very best way to live. And so for the remainder of our time today, I want to talk about sex and servanthood and their roles within the marriage relationship. And that's what brings us to Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter five, there in the New Testament where you turned to earlier. And Paul writes this about marriage. He says, and further, beginning in verse 21, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. And as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Verse 25, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ Love the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Continuing to verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, this is pointing back to Genesis 2, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Verse 32, this is a great mystery but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, Paul here is laying some, uh, some biblical ground rules for the marriage relationship and the role of husband and wife and how those two are supposed to interact. And um, he definitely underscores the fact that the marriage relationship is built on two things. It's built on servanthood and it's built on sex. He he highlights that passage from uh, Genesis chapter two. And he also uses some other language in there that help us to see how we are supposed to operate and the role that we are supposed to play within these relationships. And so um, there's a few nuggets that I wanna pull out of this um, from this passage in terms of uh, just roles and, 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 the, the whole idea of sex and servanthood and how those things work and, and operate together within um, the marriage relationship. And so some things that we need to understand about marriage in general. And so I'm going to point out three things. And if you're taking notes, maybe you want to write these down. They're going to be on the screen. Um, and the first thing that I'd like to point out uh, that, that Paul brings to our attention here in this passage is that The marriage covenant is a mirror of the covenant between Jesus Christ and his church. The marriage covenant is a mirror of the covenant between Jesus Christ and his church. And in there, Paul uses words or um, ideas that lend themselves to uh, the thought of submission and love and sacrifice. And this points us directly to servanthood. When you serve someone, you submit to them, you love them, you sacrifice on their behalf. And we are never more like Jesus than when we serve someone else. We're never more like Jesus than when we serve someone else. And in fact, one of our core values here at this church is that servanthood is our posture. And so in any relationship that we are in, think about it. Servanthood has to be at the center of that relationship, that that you're in it not just for what it can benefit you, but you're also in it for what it can benefit the other person. And that is the model that Jesus Christ set up for us as his church because he went to the cross to die in our place, to serve us. Before he went to the cross and he was gathered in the upper room with his disciples, what did he do? He served them a meal. Then he served them by washing their feet. He was all about service and putting others before himself. And so in any relationship, there's got to be servanthood. The second thing that it points out is that um, our, our relationship in terms of the way that it, our marriage relationship in terms of how it mirrors the covenant between Jesus and his church is that it's full of uh, unity or oneness or holiness. 
And that's where this idea of of sex comes in, that Paul says, he points back to Genesis chapter 2, and he says that the two would become one. They would be united together. And for some people, this thought, it's kind of weird a little bit, but it's not meant to be weird. Instead of, of, uh, you know, the sex part, just think of complete openness and vulnerability and, and connection without separation, Unity within the body of Christ, which is the church, that's the covenant that Jesus has with his church. And the same way for our marriage, that, that the two have become one. We are in union. We are united together as one unit. It is no longer male and female. It's no longer husband and wife. It is us together, not individuals, but as a couple going forward from there. So, so first, we need to underscore and understand that the marriage covenant is a mirror of the covenant between Jesus Christ and his church. Number two, what Paul lets us in on here is that sex is the primary way that marriage is different than or set apart from any other relationship. It's the primary way that your marriage is set apart from any other relationship. Think of all of the things you do as a married couple. You can do all of those with anybody else except for one thing. Sex is the one thing that makes that relationship different than any other relationship. As the scriptures say, what Paul reminds us in Genesis chapter 2, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. That is a key word right there. He is joined to his wife and the two are united as one. So not only is sex a, the, the primary thing that sets apart the marriage relationship from any other relationship, but it's important to note that from a biblical standpoint, And as far as this church is concerned and this pastor is concerned, the act of sexual intercourse is reserved only, everybody say only. Man, you guys sound so good this morning. The act of sexual intercourse is reserved only for the boundary of the marriage relationship because that is the thing that sets it apart from every other relationship. And here in 2021, I'll take that amen. Here in 2021 and the decades leading up, we we have we have gotten that twisted and distorted, and we have turned it into something that it just ought not be. And if that's you, you need to know this is not a message of condemnation. There is hope and there is love and there's grace in Jesus Christ. I want you to know that before we move on any further. That's not what this is about. I'm not trying to beat anybody over the head, but I am trying to expose us to the naked truth of God's word and the principles that are found inside of it. So number one, the marriage covenant is a mirror of the covenant between Jesus Christ and his church. Number two, sex is the primary way that marriage is different than than, or set apart from any other relationship. And number three, I wanna park right here for just a minute. Within the boundary of the marriage relationship, sex and servanthood are directly linked together. Within the boundary of the marriage relationship, sex and servanthood are directly linked together. And the problem with this is that we have, on the whole, we have an improper view of what marriage and and sex and servanthood within that relationship are actually all about. And and typically prior to marriage, I'm gonna be a little bit general and maybe a little bit stereotypical here. And so I realize that, but, but typically prior to marriage, we tend to think about it through the lens, look at it through the lens and think about it through the ways of how it will benefit us. Before we enter into a marriage relationship, the the thing that is primarily at the forefront of our thoughts and our desires and our actions is how that relationship is going to benefit us. A lot of men, before they enter into a marriage relationship, they think that a marriage relationship is going to provide them with a warm dinner every evening and hot sex every night. That's what they think. I can say that because I am a man Boy, was I wrong. Sometimes it's a cold turkey sandwich. 
let's lighten up a little bit, everybody. Let's like, I know it's a, it's a, it's a tough topic. We can be a little bit loosey-goosey. Women, on the outside of their marriage, a lot of women, they look at it like it's going to be this fairy tale thing where they're going to be served breakfast in bed and there's going to be bouquets of fresh flowers on the table every day. It's going to be your husband giving you nightly foot rubs and he's going to always listen to you, as you uh, with undivided attention as you re- recount the, the most minute details of your day for hours on end. and You will fall asleep in his gentle embrace only to be awakened by the sound of songbirds outside of your window. <laughs> and morning breath and bedhead don't exist in this world. And then what happens is, is what's the first thing we do when we get married? We go on a honeymoon and we perpetuate this lie even further, <laughs> right? We set ourselves up for some failure right at the beginning. But, but marriage, when it comes down to it and we view it through the lens of how it benefits us, marriage is not about taking. It's not about getting yours. It's about giving. It's about entering into a covenant relationship to serve the needs of your spouse. That's what your vows are all about. That richer, poorer sickness and health, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of that stuff, that's what those vows, that's what you're saying. And so for those of us that are married, for those of us that are thinking about being married someday, instead of considering what we can gain from our marriage, instead we should consider what we can give to it. Ladies, you need to understand that when you have sex with your husband, you are serving him and you are honoring God in the process. That's just biblical. I figured I'd get a way bigger amen from the guys in the room there. Apparently, they're just scrolling mindlessly on their phone, on Instagram, and they're locked into that one compartment. Men, ladies, here's your chance. Men, when you help to meet the needs of your wife outside the bedroom, not only does it honor her, but it also honors God, and it can lead to you having the opportunity to meet her needs inside the bedroom. Okay, there we go, a little bit better. And at the end of the day, what, what this boils down to is, is us putting our spouse ahead of ourself. It boils down to us putting our spouse ahead of ourself. And this is the example that Jesus gave for us who are his followers. In Matthew chapter 20, in verse 16, he says, So, so those who are last now will be first then. And those who are first will be last. Now, we skip down to to verses 26 through 28. It says, but among you, Jesus is speaking directly to his followers, among you, it will be different. That means that that the the marriage relationship that, that Christians have, that Christ followers have, they should look markedly different than the marriage relationships of those that are not a part of the church, those that do not belong to the body of Jesus Christ. He says, among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. That means that that when we enter into a marriage covenant relationship, it's got to be us willing to lay our lives down for that other person, because that is the example that Jesus set for us and how it is supposed to be for those of us who are his followers. And I've heard it said before, and men, this is a a place where you really need to to open your ears and and, and listen and take note here, that that sex does not start in the bedroom. It starts in the kitchen, and it looks a whole lot like doing the dishes. (laughs) Sex doesn't start in the bedroom. It starts in the kitchen, and it looks a whole lot like doing dishes the dishes. In fact, I read an article recently online that says that couples who engage in the activity of washing the dinner dishes together have more sex than couples who don't. 
And in that article, the author says, the thing is, the most unpopular and gross household tasks are those normally relegated to women. Typically, not always, but typically, chores falling under a wife's jurisdiction involve cleaning up after others. For example, laundry, cleaning bathrooms, and doing the dishes. But men, they're often the ones responsible for taking out the trash, mowing the lawn, washing the cars, and other jobs that might even be a kind of respite from family life. And the article goes on to say that women who do these messier chores that mean touching other people's grossness, seeing themselves as relegated to the tasks that people don't find desirable. And if that's the case, who wants to have sex with the person making a part of the mess but also not helping you clean it up? So let that sink in. So here's what I'm trying to cultivate in my marriage with my wife. And, and I hope that, that maybe you can glean some stuff from this because I would encourage you to, to try to cultivate this same kind of culture within your marriage as well. We need to work to create a culture within our marriage that is based on yes instead of if. We need to work to create the kind of culture in our marriage that is based on yes rather than if, okay? That's the difference between a contract and a covenant. A contract is based on if, a covenant is based on yes. Jesus made a covenant with us. It wasn't a contract. Jesus didn't wait for the guarantee of our love and our surrender before going to the cross to die for us. He just said yes, to death on a cross. He didn't say, if you'll love me, if you'll surrender to me, then I will die for you. No, he said, while you were still a sinner, I'm choosing the cross to die for you. And so in our marriage relationship, it can't be, if you do this, then I will do that. If you'll do the laundry, then later we can have sex. Or if we have sex, then tomorrow I will fill in the blank with whatever. And so some questions that I would ask, just like on a really practical level, and this list could go on and on, but just think about this. Will you serve your spouse by helping to wash the dishes? Yes. Will you serve your spouse by taking out the trash? Yes. Will you serve your spouse by doing your best to have dinner ready when they get home from work? Yes. Or helping with their laundry? Yes. Or listening and giving them undivided attention while they tell you about their day? Yes. Or snuggling on the couch with them? Yes. Or making sex a regular and consistent priority in your relationship and even choosing to initiate it yourself from time to time? Yes. See, when we cultivate a marriage culture that is based on yes rather than if, both spouses get met and fulfillment is achieved together. And that is a major key. All the while doing that, you're bringing honor to each other and to God by simply just creating a yes culture. Honey, baby, sugar, sweetie pie, whatever your pet name is, If you need it, the answer is yes. If it's helpful and beneficial to you, the answer is yes. I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to help meet that need. And if we will both, husband and wife, make that a commitment and a priority, it will change the way that we operate within our marriages. It will change the way our marriages look and feel will change the fulfillment level. And others around us will sit up and take notice and they'll say, hey, I want what they've got. It's all because we created a yes culture. I'm not talking about positioning yourself to being taken advantage of, but I'm talking about pouring out, laying down your life for that other person on both sides of the coin. Because the two major components of our relationship 
in marriage or servanthood and sex. Servanthood, Ephesians 6, 7. Paul writes this. He says, work or serve with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. When you serve your spouse, you're not just serving them, you're serving God. When you serve your spouse, you're not just serving them, you're serving God. So servanthood, it is an anchor component of the marriage relationship. And the second thing is sex. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. The husband, this is a command from scriptures. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Because if we're going to have a healthy marriage, we've got to have both servanthood and sex. And so the big idea here with all of this is simply this. When it comes to fulfillment in marriage, we is greater than me. You put that on the screen. When it comes to fulfillment in marriage, we is greater than me. It's not about what I can get out of it. It's about what I can contribute to it. And if we would choose to be contributors, to be givers in our marriage relationships rather than takers, it would change the landscape for us significantly. And as I bring this to a close this morning, I know that some of you, might be sitting here asking the question of the elephant in the room, but, but what about when there's a lack of sexual intimacy and servanthood in my, in my marriage? What about when things are one-sided and when it's me doing all the serving and when it's me doing everything and the, the, my, my partner is not meeting me halfway? Then, what do I do then? Let's write these down, just rapid fire. I want to give you just five tips that'll help you walk through that season. Because I realize that, that marriages and great sex and everything, it's, it's really not the norm, sadly, for a lot of people. And instead, we find ourselves in these relationships that can often feel better, that we feel like we're not getting out of it, the things that we're putting into it. And that there's hurt and there's pain and it's, it's not necessarily meeting our needs. So, so what can we do to bring that back around and get it further in alignment with God's intention and his design if it is that way? The first one of these things is prioritize daily reading the word and prayer to seek God's wisdom, grace, and mercy. Prioritize daily reading the word and spending time in prayer to seek God's wisdom, grace, and mercy. And in those moments, you need to begin to ask God to change your perspective of your spouse. We need to ask God to help us to change our perspective of the way to look at them. Second thing, we need to look at ourselves first before pointing the finger at our spouse. Look at ourselves first before pointing the finger at our spouse spouse. We talked about this um, in, in so, many, so many ways a few weeks ago at the beginning of our last series where we talked about the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139, search me and know. It's what we need to ask God to do. God, search me. If there's any wicked way in me, is there, is there any way that I'm contributing negatively to this relationship? Because here's the deal. I can't fix us if I don't first fix me. I can't fix us if I don't first fix me. So, so we got to look at ourselves before pointing the finger at our spouse and be sure that we're right so that we can help get our marriage right. The third thing, we need to continue to serve our spouse even when it's difficult. Continue to serve our spouse even when it's difficult. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. There are going to be days that are not going to be much fun. But if you find yourselves in a one-sided relationship like this, you've got to do everything that you possibly can to stay committed to your vows, to stay in line with the biblical marriage covenant, and to honor the guidelines that Paul lays out for us in Ephesians chapter 5. Continue to serve our spouse even when it's difficult. Number four. We need to keep the lines of communication open between us and our spouse. Keep the lines of communication open between us and our spouse. We need to share our feelings 
with them, but we need to share them in a loving way. Not in a nagging way, not in a hateful way, not in a, why don't you change? Why don't you do this? Why? We need to share them in a loving way. Talk to them about what you'd like to see as a part of that marriage relationship. Talk to them about what you believe that it can be if both of you work together. And then take it a step further by asking how you can help, asking how you can serve them better. And then whatever they tell you, do it. Don't just ask them, take action on it. Some of you, the, 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 the gap, the separation in your marriage right now, the, the difficulty that you're having, it, it, it could be solved if you would just go to your spouse and say, hey, what's something that I could do over the next few weeks, months, to serve you better? And then whatever they tell you, if you actually did it, that would change the game for you. So keep the lines of communication open between us and our spouse. And then number five, Patiently wait on the Lord and trust his timing. Patiently wait on the Lord and trust his timing. You need to know that things may not change instantly. Oftentimes, I've discovered that's not how God works things out. Usually, there's a process that has to be walked through, not because he's disciplining us, but because he's developing something in us. And so we've got to be willing to walk out the course in faithful obedience to him and be sure that the way that we're acting, the way that we're behaving, the things that we're bringing to the table in that relationship, that we are honoring God with them. So five tips if you're in a one-sided marriage. Prioritize daily reading of the word and prayer, seeking God's wisdom, grace, and mercy. Look at ourselves first before pointing the finger at our spouse. Continue to serve our spouse even when it's difficult. Keep the lines of communication open between us and our spouse and then patiently wait on the Lord and trust in his timing. So couples, when it comes to your marriage, What's something that you can do this week to honor God by serving your spouse? And and if something doesn't automatically come to mind, what you need to do is there couldn't be a greater thing for you to do than, than on Valentine's Day over lunch or over dinner tonight. Once you get away from the kids and it j- just, you know, the two of you, I don't know, maybe you're going to share a tub of ice cream or something before you go to bed, whatever that's going to look like. I just felt the Holy Ghost right there. (laughs) Ask them and then do it. Take action on it. And singles, you're not left out either. Even though you're not married, what's something that you could begin to do to honor God by modeling these same principles through serving someone else? If you're having trouble knowing what that might be, just look around. Maybe your school your neighborhood, your workplace, wherever it is that you go. The simple rule of thumb to help you with this is see a need, meet a need. See a need, meet a need. Maybe there's a kid in your class that needs a friend. Maybe there's a neighbor in your, um, in your subdivision that needs some help with some yard work. Maybe there's a coworker at your workplace that just needs to be invited out to coffee so that you can just listen to talk to them as they go through a tough time. You can let them know that you're praying for them. Whatever those look like, see a need, meet a need. Because at the end of the day, you and I, we were created to be in community with one another. And in any relationship, especially marriage, in any relationship, especially marriage, we is always greater than me. It's not about what we can get out of it. But in the kingdom, it's about what we can put into it. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the timeless truths that you have provided us through your word. God, we thank you that they are applicable to today and the real life situations that we find ourselves in. Lord, we thank you that, that we don't have to walk through this marriage thing, this relationship thing blindly, 
but that you have given us keys and principles for success. And God, I pray that you would make your people successful. Lord, I pray that, that um, husbands and wives, that their hearts would be turned back towards one another, and that they would be turned towards you, and that with you at the center of their relationship, Lord, that, that they would seek to serve each other with reckless abandon through the model that you have set before us, Lord. And, and that out of that, Lord, that you would raise up a, the, uh, uh, the, the best marriage that they've ever had, full of the best sex that they've ever had. God, in the midst of all of our other relationships, Lord, as we seek to, to not take from it, but to, to invest in it, Lord, I pray that, that you would help um, the, the, the relationships that we have across the board. Lord, to be uh, uh, bright examples of your love and your light and your life shining in the dark places of this community and, and through those relationships that others would sit up and take notice and that they would see that, that we, those of us who, who follow after you, where you said with us it would be different, Lord, I pray that you would make it different. Lord, that we would be set apart, that our relationships would be not normal, that they wouldn't be broken down, that they wouldn't be lacking, but instead that, that they would be, uh, bring fulfillment to, to us and those that we engage in them with and that the world would see you in and through those relationships, and that they would inspire people to follow after you. God, I thank you for what you're doing in our marriages. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing to mend the hearts of those from broken relationships. Lord, I thank you for, for how you're gonna use these tools to help people make it through those that are in, in maybe one-sided relationships this morning. Lord, I, I pray that, that you would, that you would um, drill these down and, and write them indelibly upon the hearts of those that, that one day long to be in a fulfilling marriage relationship like this. And God, through your word and through the power of your Holy Spirit at work within us, Lord, that we can have the relationships that we've always dreamed of. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.